Welcome everyone to Phil Jackson Media Availability presented by Chase. This is the MSG Training Center in Greenberg where the next president will shortly talk about the season that just finished and what is to come for the Knicks franchise. Great to have you with us. Bill Pito from our MSG studios. While we wait to hear from Phil Jackson, want to remind everyone that we have another huge night here at MSG. It's game two for the Rangers and the Canadians in the playoff series and we are set for tonight, Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday, assuming there is a game five, pregame show at six, game coverage at seven, all capped off by an hour long postgame show. That's the case for games two tonight, three, four, and assuming there is a game five. All right, so here's what's ahead for the Knicks in terms of the roster as they look forward to plotting this offseason players under contract and players that are free agents under contract. Mello, of course, a big story. What's he going to do about the no trade clause? Noah, who's got the health issues, it remains to be seen what's going to happen with his shoulder, also has the suspension carried over from the end of this season. Lance Thomas played only 46 games this year. Kuzminskis, KP, Courtney Lee, Kylo Quinn, and Billy Hernan Gomez. You see the guys who are non-guaranteed. The big question in terms of free agents, Derek Rose, meniscus surgery, played in only 64 games, and he is free to sign with whomever may be interested in him. Now, we talked about Carmelo Anthony. The up and down year with the stories about the no trade clause. Is he happy? What's going to happen in the future? That is going to be the headline of this offseason. It's hard to believe, but Melo has been a Nick now for six plus seasons. And this past year actually scored better than he did last year. 22.4 points per game, actually a bit better than his scoring average from last year. He's been playing it close to the vest as to what his preference is going to be in terms of that no trade clause. So that obviously, again, the big storyline for this postseason. Maybe the Knicks make a move uh, around the draft that will involve uh, Carmelo Anthony, but it all remains to be seen. What's going to happen with Carmelo Anthony, who may have played his last game as a Knicks the other night against Philadelphia? All right, so we're awaiting Phil Jackson media availability. It's presented by Chase, and we expect him to take questions from the media. We expect him to talk about what has happened, the season just completing with 31 wins. And, of course, this is a huge offseason for the Knicks and their president. And Phil Jackson is arriving. Let us now listen to him at the MSG Training Center in Greenburg, New York. You? You pile on? You, too? <laughs> Business must be good. Well, searching for familiar faces here. Good to see you guys. It's been a while. Um, well, we had our exit meetings, and uh, as a guy who likes to do this with the players. Felt it's one of our most disappointing ones we've had. The, um, the year, in retrospect, for the players <clears throat> was one that had a lot of hope and one that uh, I think kind of started descending around the holidays and never quit during the um, last three months of the year. Um, as a group, they felt like uh, they lost kind of their way their ability to win close games, and um, there weren't a lot of fingers pointed. We built this team, I thought, with the tension of providing support for the players that we brought back from KP and Carmelo and um, Lance Thomas guys that we brought back from last year's team to support the group that we had. And, you know, our calculations were um, provide a strong unit of starters and we didn't have a really strong bench. And our starters never really had a consistency of play as we had some injuries here and there that kind of kept them from really getting chemistry chemistry necessary to win and win close games. Um, <clears throat> for our, the uh, staff, our sake, we're looking forward to this as our beginning of our new season. This is where we start over again. 
We start rebuilding a team and we have uh, put together what we want to put together as far as collective group. A lot of things are going to happen between now and July, mid-July or August when we uh, collect the roster. But it gives us a good indication of what we want to do. It's one of the years we have a draft pick, so we're looking forward to that. Of course, we'll have a coin flip, I think, this next week to determine what position we actually will end with. Our balls will be split in half, I think, between Minnesota and ourselves, so there'll be a sharing of that. But <clears throat> it's a lottery, so whenever there's a lottery, there's always a chance that we'll move up or we could move back, as we found out a couple years ago. Um, all that being said, I never took a jump shot, never made a substitution, but the buck stops here. And, you know, we have collected a group of young guys that played really hard and well together. And I think uh, our fan corps can see the group that we played with at the end of the season that were competitive, played basketball the right way, played defense hard, and um, missing a little bit of talent. They had a great chance to, to do some good things out there in the court. Some of it not in the tanking form, which they were concerned about at one point, which we told them we're not tanking, we don't do that. Uh, and they went ahead and won some games, which is okay with us. It's the way you have to play basketball. And they learned to play together, <clears throat> so that was good. I don't know if you guys have any questions. I can't imagine why you would have any. <laughs> Everything seems so plain in the open, and most of you guys know because I'm sure you've got all the information you need. But if I can help you out, just lob something over my direction, and I'll go ahead. So Phil, um, Carmelo talked about kind of uncertainty about his future here. You mentioned the other day, you know, the organization may look to trade him again. He's looking for some clarity during this exit meeting. Was there any clarity during this exit meeting among the two of you? And, and is the organization going to look to move him this summer? What I talked to Melo about is almost what I talked about with him last year, uh, that we are not in a position to win a championship last year. If you feel like we're not moving quickly enough forward, you know, maybe it's a good time for you to decide whether you're going to stay or leave. And he opted to stay, and we put together a team that considered building around him. This year, at some point in the season, there was some information or curiosity about whether he'd be available for trades. And when we brought him in and asked him about that, it became a public thing, unfortunately. It wasn't uh, what was intended, but it became public. And uh, you know, I complimented him on the fact that he held it together really well for all the drama that went along with that, you know, or whatever was played out behind that. We found nothing available or, you know, rational for us to make at that time. So, you know, in our talks this time, we talked about how we're going to go about doing what we have to do. We will take into account his consideration. I told him we're not going to, um, this is not a situation where we're going to dump you or do anything like that, but we're looking to improve ourselves however we can. We have not been able to win, and that's our priority to win. So that's what we have to do. And um, we're communication. Our meeting was not contentious at all, and it was cordial. So we'll go forward with that. Do you, uh, do you want him back? We've not been able to win with him on the court at this time. And I think the direction with our team is that he is a player that would be better off somewhere else and using his talent somewhere where he can win or chase that championship. Right now we need players that are really active, can play every single play, defensively and offensively. That's really important for us. We started to get some players on the floor that can do that. And, you know, that's the direction we have to go. So you said you looked into it before. Are you confident that at this age, this contract, you can make a deal that 
benefits you too? That's still to be determined. Still have a long ways to go on that. So, uh, did Mello seem uh, agreeable that uh, you would waive a no trade clause for any spy? Or no, we didn't talk about that. We just talked about, you know, how, how we could make things the best possible things for both of us. A uh, place where you can go to be competitive and to be back in the hunt and something that would benefit us moving forward as a, a younger, developing team. So you said that um, it was unfortunate that some of the discussion about Carmelo, that's on the topic that you guys talked about the team, became public. Um, one of the reasons I did though is because you tweeted out a compliment to an article disparaging Carmelo. No. Didn't this, it wasn't disparaging Carmel. And that didn't happen for another month after our discussions. Um, all I said was simply this. I, I don't try and change people. They are who they are. And, you know, that, that's something that, you know, I learned a long time ago coaching. And that was the example I used. In fact, it was nice to hear from Michael Graham, who sent me a note. saying I know that kind of created a storm, but... I appreciated what you did in my coaching career. Excuse me, hon. So, you know, that, that was somehow or other the negative press or hate press or, you know, news or whatever comes along with that stuff immediately jumped on that. That wasn't meant for that. He's an elite scorer. You know, we're not trying to make him into Michael Jordan or, or uh, Kobe Bryant. That was what the article was about, wasn't it? So, given what you just said about uh, where you want to take the team, if, if possible, and what we know about the development process of young players, not just KP, with whatever you draft, mm -hmm. whatever you get, bring back for another one, and trade them. Um, have you begun to embrace the possibility or likelihood that whatever results uh, whatever positive results there might be in terms of one loss uh, in, in the standings, whatever, might not occur until after your five-year contract is up? Yeah, that's not a concern of mine. What, what uh, Jim Dolan and I talked about originally was trying to develop a process in which we were developing players and we had an identity. And this is one of the things that bothered us this year is that we did not have an identity. Um, the identity has oftentimes been run into the system that I had, but it's basically about ball movement, player movement, aggressive play, how to play every play, those type of things that uh, create teamwork. And, and I think people appreciate, our fans appreciate that. We developed the D-League as a part of a developmental thing. We brought up two or three players now, maybe four players that have played in this D-League. This is all part of what we're trying to do to build an organization. And I think, you know, people see that we are where we're going with this. I mean, obviously, we don't have a lot of draft picks in the last couple of years. Our draft pick in KP turned out to be a pretty good deal. We're hoping this draft pick will be a player of some talent. But we understand that a lot of these are young people that it's going to take three or four years for them to develop. So in that process, it may be beyond my tenure here in which a team becomes vibrant, you know, competitive, have a chance for, you know, maybe to go on beyond just being in the playoffs. That's okay with me. Uh, you know, I didn't come here to particularly just to win a championship, but to, to do things that, you know, we're directed by my instructions from Dolan. Let's have something that represents something. Let's have something that is identifiable as who we are and how we play. There were a few times this year where maybe uh, you could have diffused things that maybe got out of control in the media if you had talked. Um, and when you came in, you said you were going to be open and you were going to have a relationship. Uh, why haven't uh, us, or really the fans, anyone heard from you this whole year? I don't know who else has to talk in this business. I mean, who else is uh, relegated to talking in front of the press? Um, anybody? Yeah, I, I agree with that. I mean, there's some fan things, but you guys aren't fans, right? All right. 
Um, you know, there, there are a number of incidents that stepped in the way of this, obviously. Um, anticipated perhaps during the uh, trade deadline that we'd make a statement, but nothing happened in the trade deadline, so there's nothing to talk about in that particular aspect. Uh, there's no um, definition as far as you know, what was going on with Carmelo and um, that incident that happened. You know, there's no way to define that. So, you know, it just didn't feel like it was the right, right time for me. And in my own personal life became an issue this year that I had to deal with on, on my own. So there's some also some personal things that weighed in on that. Still things like, like when Derek was missing, is that something you were a coach? Did a coach have to be the one explaining that stuff away? Well, what was the explanation? Really right. There was no explanation. There really wasn't any you know, story that was behind that. This is a young man that all of a sudden felt, you know, very definite pull to going home to his family in a situation that had been a high energy tension situation since August. I guess he left us in September, but I mean, really he didn't anticipate what was going to go on in the whole preseason thing that went on with him. And that just built up to a point where you, he, he went AWOL. Came back and he apologized. We subsequently did what we are going to do with a player that misses a game. And we said, let's go on from here. But that was one of the things I thought was a disruptive thing for the team. But I think the team went by that. It wasn't something that was particularly what held them back. What is your plan for Derek in the future for the agent? Just any surgery? We had a good conversation with him today. He expressed the fact that he wants to be back. We talked about him going through, um, you know, rehab and work and whatever he has to do, and he's chosen to go back to Chicago to do that. Um, he will be in L.A., but he also took time out to say he really enjoyed playing here, even with the losses, which, of course, surprises us a little bit because he's been on some very successful teams, but he said he wants to have a chance to redeem himself as a player. I, I like that attitude. I like who Derek represents as himself. He's a warrior dr directed at taking on a big challenge. Still off the part of my question. Okay. Talking about building with young players, more athletic team going forward, and you know and that the team might realize its potential beyond your tenure here. Could you explain why you feel that it's so important for the team to play a specific, very specific style of offensive ball, trying to when it's entirely likely, I mean, not guaranteed, but it's entirely likely that your successor or another coach would not want to embrace something that they're not either familiar with or don't believe in. So why invest that time with young players in their formative years in the league when it's very possible that that will not be the system they ultimately play down the road. So their individual development, for the sake of their individual development. I got it. I got your argument. Um, <clears throat> basketball is made up of particularly um, simple acts. It's not rocket science. Um, that's Red Holzman used to say that all the time. This is not rocket science. Pretty simple. You have to be able to handle a ball. You have to be able to stop with a ball. You have to be able to pass the basketball. You have to be able to use footwork. You have to be able to use various aspects of timing and team play. Um, somehow or other, we've got completely off course here in the idea that a system of basketball, particularly one that's been called the sideline triangle, which is now just called a triangle offense, as being an impediment to a basketball team. This is not an impediment. Um, when, you, when you build a system of, of anything, and you know, we can, I can take a number of incidents that are like this um, in sports, whether it's teams that I've coached, um, Belichick, uh, Seattle Seahawks, there's an identifying way in which they play. And when you develop that system so that people are all on board with the system, then you have something that's concrete. It's an understandable format that you're working with. Inside of developing that as a coach, 
you develop a certain standards and those standards are upheld. There's a certain way to play. We don't play basketball any other way but this way. And so those are the things that are important. It's not particularly that we run the pinch post or the blind pig or whatever else is common vernacular that we may use as terminology in the system of offense. It's the actions and how you get to that and that you're playing team basketball that counts. We're not doing anything different here. It's just basketball as it is. But somehow or other, it's got to be a resistant format in which um, a lot of players don't have, per se, the skills, as you alluded to, to play in a system of offense that requires a skill. So we're trying to teach that in our D-League and in our young players how to have the fundamental skills to do this. Does that make sense? All right, I'll continue on from there. So as we go through this kind of stuff, it all falls in line. And then leadership, seniority, and, and you know, composing a team becomes the order that goes on, on behind all of that. And if you know um, that type of thing, then you can fit other people inside that style of play that complement each other. So it's no wonder that the Spurs can have some success continuing their action or you know, Patriots can have success because they can put people in places or the fact that we could do that in Bulls and in the Lakers situation because we had something that was concrete and you can have something that you identify somebody's skills, you bring them in and they can fit in if their character is correct or characters fit it for that group. Does that make sense to you guys? Why hasn't it worked then? We face resistance. And we face resistance at the top. Yeah, I mean, you know, we got rid of some guys early on that resisted, didn't show that, you know, that they were willing to be learners or willing to take into effect that, you know, this is how we want to play and this is what we're going to do. And so, you know, we had to make some, some changes. We had a young coach, so we made some changes at that time. Uh, you know, I just let, I let Jeff do what he wanted to do. We had an agreement that he would try to blend his, what we call, whatever that flow, fast break, early shooting offense into something that was formatted that could be end of game type of stuff so we could have functions at the end of the game. So they, they showed that they could do that to the end of the season. They started being able to do some of that, which was important. Do you think any part of it, though, is you coaching it? <clears throat> yes. And now someone else is coaching it. That's, and that's coach very true. Before. So is it fair to put him in that position? Well, you know, right? you know, Kurt Ramos is assistant associate head coach, and he's, he has all the knowledge that I have. And, you know, so they, they I thought there's a combo they could fit together pretty well. And, uh, you know, without Derek here the first month, you know, then to start and blend this in together with something that's quite simple, you know, it was not an easy task, and I understand that. So we kind of let it roll until things didn't roll well, until end of February before saying, you know, it looks like we need some more um, fundamentals, a little more function out there towards the end of the game, a little more skills. So I think we should start doing some things that create that. You know, I think uh, one of the reasons that you were brought in was to kind of build the culture, rebuild the culture of this organization that's kind of really what can you say about the culture of this place now that you've been here for three full seasons? And do you think that, that how much has the losing impacted? Yeah, losing losing's a, is a tough situation, there's no doubt. I, I like um, the backbone of what we have. I like the people that are in Portsmouth that are looking at talent. They know what they're looking for. You can see what we've got is talent. You can see the guys like Ron and Chase and, and, and and uh, Willie, Hernan Gomez, and the, the kids that we're bringing into this organization have a certain sense about how to play in the structure and the way we want to play. So I, I think we're moving in that direction. It's not fast enough, obviously, to carry the day. But I think we're going to get there, and I think we keep insisting upon the type of players we want. It's going to be there. But behind the scenes, in the group that we have, uh, you know, Mike, teammate work with Steve Mills and 
Jamie Matthews and Christian, you know, Patasic and the people that are in our scouting, I think we, we know what we want. Uh, and we're interested in developing that and turning away from just, you know, say, this guy can jump out of the gym, this guy can do a triple-double gainer to dunk the ball. We're, that's not what we're interested in. We're interested in skilled players that know how to play together in a team form. You're confident that Jeff is the guy going forward to get you guys past that man. That's four years in a row. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, uh, Jeff has a, has a good basketball mind. I, I think he's um, amenable to players. Uh, he's a young coach. He's only coached, um, what's this, two and a half seasons he's coached. It's not like, you know, he's got a, a menu of 10 years of coaching. So he's, uh, yeah, I think he listens. Um, you know, we have good communication going back and forth. Um, I think there's some disconnect at times with this team, and I think there's some rebelliousness in this team that created some of the discord during the year. Um, and I think that has to stop, and that, that will stop. Huh? You mentioned Kurt in terms of with the, he's there to help with the triangle. Do you think that puts, I mean, he's the associate head coach, he's the head coach last year. Do you think that puts Jeff in a tough situation? Having no, I, I don't think so. The one thing about uh, the coaching staff, they kind of felt like uh, Kurt was the most outspoken guy defensively, and he got kind of punched into that because that was our biggest need. Defense seemed to be the issue most of the time. So, you know, Kurt kind of took that job on and, and instead of, you know, really the other aspect of it, perhaps the offensive end, they, they, were, they were averaging 105, 106 points a game. That seemed to be like, okay, that's pretty good. Let's see if we can, you know, straighten out our defense. With Joe, with Joe Kim, I you know, I'm sure you didn't think you were getting defensive player of the year, Joe Kim, but were you surprised at his lack of mobility this year and how concerned are you about him moving forward on that contract? I thought that, uh, you know, I saw Joe Kim, uh, shoulder injury, shoulder surgery a year ago, missing, you know, playing 20 some games in the last year with his Bulls. You know, concerned, uh, but he's 31, you know, he's still relatively young. There's a great heart in this guy. He's got passion for the game. His combination with Derek seemed to be a perfect combination. Der Derek Rose and Joe Kim together because they team well together. Um, defensively, he was a defensive player of the year. All those things seemed to jump out at me as a really good thing. You know, we, we talked a lot about, you know, can you get yourself back into this condition? Um, hamstrings, hamstrings, hamstrings. Eventually, it ended up being a knee that was creating ultimately other problems. So, you know, we hope going forward, and, you know, he's, he expresses great dedication towards getting back to what he was or what he or who he is as a basketball player. So I have to trust him in that. So when did you uh, pick up your option and was that just kind of I didn't pick it up. Just that's just that's just all. That will be lining a birdcage somewhere, whoever writing that stuff. Is there such things as papers anymore, guys? <laughs> um, you know. There was kind of an informal thing about that. There was never like formally Yeah, he's yeah, Carmelo's been great. He's who he is. He just he's a uh, you know elite scorer. You know, this guy's going to be a Hall of Fame entry at some point. You know, 10, 15 years down the road. Um, you know, he's he's carried the the basic load for this team. Uh, you know, uh, I thought he stood up well this year in in a lot of tough situations. I can't regret it. Yeah, I can't go back and regret that. Um, Obviously, it hasn't worked out in this partnership together. Somehow or other, it didn't click here with this team. But, um, you know, he, he's, done his, he's done his role and played his, his role quite well. Either draft or somewhere along the line in um, uh, free agency, uh, you know, uh, Derek's expressed hopes coming back. You know, we have some options. And, uh, you know, Derek's a, a scoring guard uh, in first and foremost, uh, you know, 
organizing, leading, stuff like that's not particularly his strength, but as a scorer, he's unparalleled. Uh, someone told me uh, today that he's still a leading guy in the league in the paint, scoring in the paint. So it, that says something about this guy's willing to take it in there and challenge. Did Carmelo tell you that he wanted to leave as well? And what no. If he wants to stay? He did. You know, he has a he has a no trade. Right. But we have an agreement when we sat down and wrote a contract about that no trade. That both parties felt like it was time. It was time. But you you said that you think you know it's time for him to go chase a championship or do whatever. I, you know, I I just said I just said we haven't won here. You don't want to end up your career not winning. Um, this is not something that you, you know you want to have labeled on your career. You want to get to that territory where you have a chance to win. And you know that's we talked around that. Uh, but I, he, he likes it here in New York. He, he Express that. You portrayed your relationship with him this season as a disconnect. What, do you agree with that? And how and why did that happen? Well, you know, I suppose there's there's some um, residential stuff about uh, you know saying that he held the ball when Lisa Leslie posed a question to me about we played in a triangle offense. I don't know what that CBS show that they that they have. We need to talk. You know, why does Carmelo hold the ball? And I said Carmelo holds the ball, so he knows that he holds the ball, but he knows how to play in this offense. But that became a sticking point. Uh, I reached out to Melo immediately after that, when that became like some press news that became big news, like Phil criticizes Carmelo. I did criticize Carmelo. We talked about it in his contract signing. You hold the ball. You only get so many of those in the game. You have to keep moving them all. So I reached out to him right after that and tried to you know, continue that communication. Um, so, I mean, there's, there's a, a number of little gaps like that, even after the spots on the leopard tweet that I, I threw out there that was a, you know, come back at that ding, you know, was not meant for him, but it's, you know, it came out that way. And I, I told him I'm really sorry that happened. So, you know, we tried to connect a couple different ways. And I'm, I'm a guy that's, you know, here. I come to practices, you know, I'm in the cafeteria, my door's open in my office. Saying the same things basically, that he was waiting for you to talk to him. It seems like you were waiting for him to talk to you. No, I went to him. I went to him. Do you, do you worry that the way your relationship with Carmel kind of unfurled publicly will hurt you with free agents? No. no. Not at all. If you are able to move him, assuming that you don't have something that's actually probably going to be Chris Staff's team or at least the foundational piece of things, do you think he's ready for that responsibility? No. I don't. He's 21 years old. I mean, that's a big load for, you know, anybody to take on. But he's, he's shown that he's competitive. He's shown that he's got a, you know, a, a, a sense of desire to win, et cetera. So, you know, we're really pleased with how he, he's developed. I think he had a, some concern this year about physical, not being able to, to stand up to all the games physically. Achilles tendon, back, etc. You actually used the word rebuilding before and starting over. You said, um, can we assume you're not going to do what you did last summer and go out and sign veteran win now guys? That you're looking at this as a back to a slow <coughs> process? And, and you have another I think you can do both. I think you can do both together. We obviously have three draft picks, right? So we're going to bring in some young players. Um, <clears throat> we obviously have money. For a contractual, you know, situation in the free agency, so we'd like to to do a little bit of both in this, uh, and we'd like to have a team that's you know, competitive. I thought this team was competitive, but they could win. It's a very unique situation. How many games this team lost in the last two, three minutes, last shots even? Do you, you have any thoughts on what happened at the Garden with Charles Oakley? I know you actually got in there with Charles to calm him down. What was your thoughts on that? I try not to think about that at all, and I not, don't want to comment on it. It's just it's gone on way too long. That stuff. How do you so as someone who won championships as a player and coach, how frustrating is it that you haven't found success here fast enough to be in your series and executive? Um, 
Well, uh, you know, that's all about being in the now, I guess, is, is you know, that stuff is just rings in a safe deposit box. You know, it doesn't hold any weight right now for me. Uh, I mean, you know, <clears throat> um, mother of four of my children called up and said, you know how excited we were at this time of the year to be going into playoffs? What does it feel like for you? I said, it feels like a long summer, and that's what it feels like. But we get work done this summer. We can do some things that I think is going to improve this team. So that's what we have to look at. It's right now. This is who we are right now. Has this job been more difficult for you than you envisioned originally? And what have you learned? Hmm. Well, I've learned I have to put <clears throat> a probably be better at mentoring. Mentoring players? Well, everybody. Yeah. Then, uh, you know, I, I think that <clears throat> one of the things that uh, – I like about this job is that uh, Steve, uh, Jamie Matthews, and Steve Bills, you know, do a lot of the paperwork, the you know, back and forth with the NBA or um, headquarters. And you know, my <clears throat> my issues is about you know, um, talking to the coaches, finding out the game plan. And I, I think that you know, I kind of left them alone to see how they were going to perform this year in a, in a way. Um, you know. Took some time on the West Coast during the holidays when I think things really kind of fell down over New Year's and the subsequent week after New Year's and a sixth loss in a row right there, which changed us from being a positive to a minus type of year. So I think that that's where, you know, I got to do a little more <clears throat> on scene, on target mentoring. Will you be doing, <clears throat> excuse me, about those uh, triangle tech clinics? Do you plan to do more of those? Do you have the guards in? Um, I don't know if it's clinic. I think it's just a little demonstration of how simple, you know, entrance is. You know, there, there seemed to be a <clears throat> disconnect in Derek Rose that, you know, all you did was throw the ball and go to the corner and stand. And I just wanted to show him in a half an hour the variety of things that you could do that were <clears throat> really creative, not Simple. They're very creative things. No, I think <clears throat> I disagree. I think ninety percent of the talk when I'm in the in with the coaches and we're in the film session or talking about a game is about defense. They're they're really focusing on the defense. And one of the things that offense does do is it creates a situation where you can defend out of it. But that doesn't help screen roll offense, which is happening now. That mostly controls transition defense, which we used to think was the most important thing in basketball is your transition defense. Now it's about how can you control screen roll. Well, <clears throat> the league has made a giant step towards allowing guards to have freedom. Big guys are even using their hands on screening at the top of the key. There's a whole disregard for the referees to call that as a foul, although it's not the same on the baseline when a guy is screening. I think they really want the guards to be out there, the Westbrooks, the Hardens, the Isaiah Thomas, Currys, etc. That's been the directional change in the league, and I think it's on point. And that has to be your defensive. That has to be everything about what you're doing defensively. Do you switch? Do you have guys that are capable of switching? Do you have a shot blocker? Is that going to be good enough to do it? Are you going to sink underneath? You know, all these combinations are what cost us the ability to set up a really good effort about defense. And I think that some of the guys came with preconceived ideas of how they wanted to play defense. But then physically, they weren't able to play defense in the, the format that they wanted to. So that became kind of a push and shove and a, a push and pull, I should say, between the coaches and the, the players at some point. They were frustrated. The players couldn't execute what they wanted to execute. So it became a, really a focus with this team was what about our defense? Is that something that can be sorted out this summer? You know, new personnel, same coaching staff? Is it just a matter of turning the page and starting again you know, in September? Well, it's on ball defense. You saw Ronnie Baker get up there and get into people's bodies and get people over and get in front of guys, and it's not going to happen every time, but he changed how we play. I mean, it's just as simple as that, that, uh, you know, we had someone that was willing to fight and fight into bodies and over screens. Um, in our process of looking at 
people for this team, we're going to look at that type of defense. I've also recommended full court pressure as, a, as an alternative because I think that that's got to be something you consider if you're a coach. Um, I used it over the years. I think it's valid to, to take people out of their places that they want to start their offense from, make them have to work, change the clock, the 24-second clock. So we're considering some of that stuff, and we'll talk about it. A couple of your former players who are now in the media have said maybe things you did as a coach, uh, motivational type things, some of the things you say don't reach players the same way now that you're in the front office. Have you found it's difficult for you to kind of take the temperature of the guys or, or say things to push the right buttons from a different role now where you are? Mm, I don't know. I don't know if I can claim that or not. Um, yeah, you know, I, I guess, you know, coaches are always in front of the press. They're always in front of their teams. There's somebody from Mike Fratello came out with some kind of figure like 5,000 times you're in front of a team talking to a team if you're a coach. It's an inordinate amount of time, you know. And your tone, your, your caustic remarks, your compliments, all those things are so gilded and guided by, you know, the temperature of the team and the win-loss record. You know, when you sit back in a position I'm at, I get on the court, a couple times I've had to stop practice and say, hold it, <laughs> we can't play that way. You know, just to emphasize what the coaches are trying to say. Because there, there's a point in which you have to be there with the players and, and actually stop them. So, you know, I've tried to do some of that, but not intrude in the coach's, you know, direction. But I think that that is something that has to be done because, as I've said a few times, we have to know who we are and what we stand for and how we're going to play. And that has to keep continually be offered as a ideal or goal. This is who we are. So if I have to do that from different forms or places, and I'll try to do that. But... I haven't been very good at tweeting. I kind of given up that. Uh, I've given Barkley's the credit for saying, "What is he tweeting for?" <laughs> do you think that if you do more on-site mentoring, like you said, and stopping practice, that you'll be um, perceived to be micromanaging or undermining Jeff? Probably, I probably will. I, I don't. Would you think like that if you were to say? Um, if the point, if the point was valid, you know. I had coaches that I allowed the liberty to do that if they saw something on the sideline and they felt like it was bypassed and had to be emphasized. So I think that's being open and candid. So I would hope that a coach would be uh, forthright and could be able to handle something like that. So I think you talked to fellow in the exit interview and, and the points you brought up to him about what's best for him and what's best for the team. If you can't get what you need, can he return here? Wow. Well, that's a long way down the road. But there are very few options, you know, at that level, you know. But there are options. So. Bill, what's one thing that fans can expect in the fourth year from the Knicks, whether it be the culture or on the court, that they haven't seen in the past few years? Playing hard. Like we played the last five, six games. Guys getting up into people, playing hard, pick up full court at times, you know, ball movement activity instead of standing, those type of things. That's what they're going to see more of. Why did that click later in this season? Was it because of the new transition? Yeah, I, I, you know, I think what, you know, we had scores a lot on the floor. I mean, you have Derek, you have Bello, you have KP. And they're scores, and their men, mindset is about when do I get a shot, when do I, you know, it's, when's it my turn, and, and they kind of feast off scoring as to how their game's going. And I, I think that that's something that you can't have on a basketball team. You just have to play. Scoring comes, it comes. If it's not, you know, you get itchy for a shot or you get you know, in a position and you put up a shot, it's probably going to be a bad shot. And that's going to change how the team plays. Everybody's going to be a little bit taken back by it. If guys don't get shots, then they can't hang their head. Defense is where you have to make your mark. That's, that's the type of thing that I think we have to go forward with. Do you regret last summer trying to... Win with Carmelo, basically, maybe. Win. No, no, I, you know, I, I can't go back and regret that. I think it was a good opportunity. It didn't work. You know, it didn't work. We had stuff that happened that we couldn't account for. That's just what happened. If Melo accepts uh, Melo as a player with agent or trade clause, is the priority to uh, the reset button, or is it you want to make sure you get a certain amount of value back? This guy plays 34 minutes a game. 
It's a big hole to fill. You know, we want a significant player that you know could hopefully fill that that role, but that's that's still to be determined. That's a long way off. I don't know. I mean, you've got teams going in the playoffs that could be eliminated right away and say, you know, that's not good enough. We're, we're not good enough. You know, we've got to go somewhere else. And um, one of the things about NBA basketball, there are 29 teams that feel like they fail at the end of the season in June. Everyone goes home unhappy. I mean, if you're happy about losing in the finals, it probably you got your head screwed on the wrong way because you go through the conference and you win the conference, you're feeling pretty good about yourself. That's one of the worst things that can happen is to lose in the finals. If you lose in the first round, well, it didn't work out. We got to change some people on our team. You know, so there may be some, you know, quick outs. It may change some people's minds as to what they're going to do. Um, yeah, we had we had you know teams that were interested in making the chase. Um, some teams called that weren't amenable to uh, you know Melo and his group. Some teams called that were, but weren't willing to give up core groups or members of their team, which is understandable at that time of the year. So we said no. You know, that's that's we're not going to make that up. When, when you say amenable to Melo and his, and he told you, I'll go to this team, I'll go to that team. Yeah, we, we had an indication of some teams. I just do not divulge that with you, though. When you got through this a couple of years now, trying different rebuilds, and you're facing it again, so mm -hmm. is, in your experience, what you've seen, is anything off the table? Is, is you say, Chris Stapps is untouchable. Are you listening to everything, and everything is possible? Uh, everything's got to be possible. And we have to make sure that people have something to say, we listen to it. We examine it. What do you say to the, to the Knicks fan that was pretty excited when you came in here in March or four years ago? I think, I, I think our fans have seen a progress. It's not in the one loss column, but I think they've seen progress in how we're, you know, what we're looking for and who we've put in place to have a chance to play and how they're playing. I think that's kind of evident, but it's not evident in one loss, that's for sure, because they can look at the one loss record and say, well, you know, not in the playoffs. I, you know, when I was coaching in Chicago and they made a decision to go drop down from winning six championships in whatever, nine years or eight years or whatever it was, you know, that ownership said the worst place to be is to be six, seven, eight, five, six, seven, eight, and be in and out of the playoffs and not drafting high drafts and getting quality players, you might have to just start over again. They started over again. How many years ago was that? 99. It's getting close to 20 years, right? That They got into the finals in the conference, but not to the finals in the league. So it takes a, it's, it's, it's a hard process putting teams together. And you have to be pretty sure that that's the way you want to go in building. I mean, you know, look at all the people, the personnel that they've been able to go through in that process. We're trying to do it with still some players that I think are talented. When we um, had a board and we looked at our board, we looked at our players, we felt like, you know, we have, you know, a dozen players that we're still very confident can support and be a part of a team. So we feel pretty good about that. Now, some of them are free agents, but still in all, you know, that's up to them. It's up to us to make an offer to them. So you clarified your comments about Carmelo, but there still could be a public perception that another free agent of desire will be coming here. What would you say to them to let them know that they would be treated the same way? What, what's the treatment? What, what treatment are you talking about? You clarified to us about the comments, whether it be through Twitter, that the subliminal tweets and that they may have been misguided. Uh, I've never, I've never uh, criticized Carmelo, ever criticized Carmelo. That's all supposition by papers or whatever, speculation by opinionated people. Holding the ball is not a criticism. That's what he does. That's pure fact. Is that a person, you know, a person better be able to take that if they're going to be coached or else they can't be part of this organization. 
And that's that's simply matter of fact. If you're a basketball player, you got to be able to be coached. We mentioned uh, Przingis not being ready to be the number one option this past season. Was there some elements that surprised you? Did, did he show enough progress? Or how did you? I thought he took shots that were good shots. He had a game. He didn't take a three. I told him I thought was that was important. If it's not there, you don't have to take a three. That's sometimes just a cheap way to score points, you know, or you get anxious to score points. Um, he had a shorter delivery on his shot. He learned some post-up things that were good. Yeah, I, I think that there were some things that are really positive about KP's uh, year. We mentioned that you say progress. Um, I think it's tough to see, though, when, I mean, even the players this season were saying, so much confusion. We didn't know what we were going to run half the time. Even when we came into practice, we didn't know what was going on. And then it, you, you kind of changed the roster now. I guess two straight summers. Where where is the how did, how, is, how how do you define progress? I think in a, in the way you want to play, in in a, a simple matter of um, young talent. That's you know we we need to get ta more talented as a basketball team. And I th think we got more talented as a basketball team. I think we got talented players that play team basketball. that wanted to move the basketball and wanted to play in a certain team for, uh, format that was good. So I think that's the, the indication. Okay. All right. Th thanks, guys. Thank you. Oh. All right. So Phil Jackson talking to the media for about 50 minutes. And the headline here, it seems clear that the Knicks are going to try – to trade Carmelo Anthony with the quote from Jackson, quote, I think the direction with our team is that he, Melo, would be better off somewhere else. Jackson's saying these Knicks were competitive, they just couldn't win, and with Melo they just haven't won enough, and it seems pretty clear at this point that the Knicks president is going to start over, build around some of the young pieces that he and the Knicks developed this year, try to add some young pieces through the draft and sprinkle in some veterans. So you get the sense now that it's going to be the Knicks post Melo, and it's going to be, in many ways, a completely new start. Derrick Rose, in his exit meeting, by the way, mentioned to Phil Jackson that he wants to come back. And another big question, Joe Kim Noah uh, mentioned that he hopes to be physically back. So those are a couple of things to watch this postseason. Here's what's ahead for you this summer. We have Knicks Night Live June 21 and June 28, as well as July 5th and July 12th. And in July, we will have full coverage of Knicks Summer League. The draft lottery is May 16th. The NBA draft is June 22, and the Knicks figure to have a high draft pick. So a very big offseason ahead for the Knicks. Thanks for watching. And again, the headline, it looks like Phil Jackson and the Knicks are going to try to trade Carmelo Anthony. But will they get a deal that they like? That's to come during the summer. Thanks for watching, everyone.